So friends, I am in Memphis. This is Mid-South Coliseum you see out in the distance. I am here with the Coliseum Coalition to save Mid-South. So we're going to let these guys tell you a little bit about what is going on. Make sure that you go to ColiseumCoalition.org and check out for more information. And if you're able to help, give. Demolition of the Mid-South Coliseum. Uh, we didn't think that was too good of an idea. So we kind of like uh, sprang into action. And from January of 2015 to May, we kind of built the plane and the runway all at the same time. And as of May, 2000, May 23rd, 2015, four years ago in a day, uh, we held our very first roundhouse revival outside the Mid-South Coliseum. Where any, anybody show hands, anybody was there? It was an awesome day. Um, we thought we'd be lucky to have, oh, 1,500, 2,000 people. Well, 4,500 people showed up. Uh, and we had a day of music, wrestling, and basketball, the, the three core uh, brands, if you will, that made the Coliseum famous. And we, uh, yes, we had Jerry Lawler and Bill Dundee wrestling the Coliseum Crushers, those awful heels. Uh, and I think that was a, 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 a big reason that we got a great draw. Uh, uh, weather also cooperated with us, but, uh, but I think in an overarching way, the, the, the reason we had a great crowd that day is because people love the Mid-South Coliseum, uh, and they miss it. They miss it being on the map. Uh, the Coliseum, we've come to learn over the last four and a half years, the way people feel about it, and this is through events, but also uh, I just founded a whole other separate uh, organization called Friends of the Fairgrounds. We did a year-long stakeholder input process where we got all sorts of input from, from all sorts of people who uh, live around the neighborhood or work on or adjacent to the property. And what they told us was, like, essentially, the Coliseum is the emotional heart of the fairgrounds, right? So uh, there are reasons why the Coliseum is not really being... Uh, so, so the, the redevelopment of the fairgrounds is, is going in phases, and the Coliseum is in the next phase, uh, which is a bit of a head-scratcher. A lot of people are like, why don't we think about all the pieces all at once so that we can come up with the best plan, right? Um, and we can, we can get into uh, the, the reasons uh, that might be here in a second. But, so the Coliseum Coalition, we, had, we held our first pre-vitalizing event. A bunch of people showed up, and uh, that was our really kind of coming out party where you if you will, where people said, hey, this isn't just a bunch of middle-aged white guys pining for Van Halen in their, in their prime. This is a mass movement of people that's as diverse as Memphis is. And so lots of people of every different stripe showed up that day. And that's where we really kind of like uh, uh, gained a, a more of a mass acceptance. A couple months later, the, the Urban Land Institute uh, national panel of ex-mayors came in. They did their own assessment. The National Charette Institute did their own data crunching, handed it to the, the ULI uh, panel, and they issued a set of recommendations in June of 2015. And, uh, and that was, they were brought here by the city and paid to come here by the city. So those of us in the grassroots were a little bit worried because, you know, like, the city had the plan to demolish, and the city is the one who had invited these experts, and, and it was the city staff that was taking them out for all the barbecue and stuff, and it really schmoozing them. So we thought, what chance do we really have that our agenda is going to get a fair shake? Uh, thankfully, the ULI is, is a fantastic organization, and lo and behold, that panel uh, recommended, among other things, that the Coliseum should not be demolished, that it's a, that it's a historic and civic anchor. Uh, it was a sister building to when the, the Liberty Bowl, they were built at the same time uh, as sister facilities. So the UL, if you take those as both two important events in 2015, a ton of people showed up and said, wow, we love this place, we're glad to be invited back. And then you have a panel of mayors come in from outside the country and kind of like try to have an objective view and taking in all the information, doing their own interviews, taking this data from the, the National Shred Institute and coming up with their own assessment, they agreed with us. Uh, now, they didn't say exactly how to reopen it, and that's, that's been the challenge ever since, is, is, is the mix of uses, uh, and steering around the, the, the uh, political impediments, if you will. Uh, but so, after that, uh, I uh, peeled off to do Friends of the Fairgrounds, but the Coliseum Coalition stayed at their posts doing what they do best, 
and Chooch here, Chooch Pickard. I'm a, uh, I'm a preservation architect and vice president of the Palestine Coalition. He did, he led a team of architects, code experts, mold experts, ADA people, uh, to do, and, for, and they were in the building for three full days to produce a comprehensive assessment of the building, which showed that it's in excellent shape and that it would cost $7 million less to, to, to reopen than previously estimated. Um, we feel like the, the previous administration had, had, had come up with a, an artificially high number to have a pretext to demolish. So we proved that it was in great shape. But you might be saying, well, OK, sure. The activists are going to go in and say, it's in great shape. Well, the city, um, so we had a, a change of administration. And the, the current mayor, Mayor Strickland, his administration uh, started to pursue the, the tourism development zone in earnest. And in, and in doing so, they hired the, the firm of Allen and Hoschel to do their own assessment of the building. And wouldn't you know it, Allen and Hoschel corroborated the findings of Chooch's team and said, yes, that's correct. The building is in excellent shape. So countless opinion polls that have like tracked along with that year of pre-vitalizing events, people are out there, they're excited about the, you know, a lot of people at first were like, yeah, you know, is it okay to say this? I, I, I love the Coliseum, is that okay? So in the early days, it was like, it had been such a fraught parcel for so long, and so many people had like said, ah, you can, you can never reopen it, it's closed. 2006 was really the low ebb of civic optimism, really. Uh, and so maybe closing it at the time made sense. Uh, but, you know, we've rattled off a lot of civic wins just in the last five years. I think it seems much more possible to the average Memphian at this point, especially when you realize we're the city that reopened Crosstown Concourse. We could rehab the old Sears building and turn it into Crosstown Concourse. We can re reopen this building. It's really just a matter of civic will. So you've got Public opinion has moved demonstrably, even within 2015, and of course ever since then, moved demonstrably in favor of reopening or repurposing the Mid-South Coliseum. And at the same time, now we have two separate assessments that show that the building is in excellent shape. Um, there is a uh, Elvis Presley Enterprises Grizzly City lawsuit that's, that's hanging over this like a, like a, a dark cloud. And until that's adjudicated and settled, uh, we'll, we'll probably we'll be able to move, to move forward. Elvis Presley Enterprises asked the city to uh, increase the amount of its TIF district percentage so they would have additional money to build a brand new 6,200 seat venue contiguous with Graceland. We understand why they want it contiguous with Graceland because it maximizes the tourist spend, uh, it fits into their, their, uh, their Graceland TDZ. There are lots of financial reasons, but we've tried to make the case to Elvis Presley Enterprises that if you want a mid-sized venue, We've already got one, and it's in great shape, and it's the Mid-South Coliseum, and oh, by the way, Elvis actually played here, as that photo uh, attests to. We think it could be a great plan B for Elvis Presley Enterprises if they, if, if they but, but I really feel like the economic reasons, it, you know, Joel Weinchacker is going to do everything in his power to get that building built contiguous with Graceland. And that's the reason, until that lawsuit says, finally, one side is right and the other is wrong, will kind of be in this no man's land. And the reason that has an effect on the Coliseum is that um, the, the current administration, if they were to violate the non-compete clause by, they, they are not allowed to contribute money or any type of incentive towards the establishment of, very important word here, a new venue. So if I'm Mayor Strickland, I don't want to be the mayor that lost the Grizzlies to Seattle because I gave them a loophole to leave either, right? So like, he has to navigate this conservatively until the, until the courts decide this. He, he can't act. So therefore, the Grizzlies' uh, assertion that somehow the non-compete clause means the Coliseum can't reopen as a venue, which is false, has been allowed to kind of persist. We think that similar to Elvis Presley Enterprises missing a golden opportunity, the Grizzlies are for sure missing a golden opportunity. We think if they move their developmental team, the hustle, here, imagine a reopened Mid-South Coliseum, made ADA compliant with the Memphis Hustle playing here, AAU basketball, high school game of the week, Division II at NAIA college basketball, perhaps the Lady Tigers. Here, conference alignment says that in many conferences require that your ladies team play at an actual arena, which the field house is not. So if you think about Memphis and being a basketball city, uh, a mix of basketball uses all stacked in here uh, could be a great anchor tenant collectively. And right, well, right as we, we'll go down that first hallway first, there's a poster on the wall. It's the, from the 2005-2006 
NAIA college basketball tournament. So that level of basketball was already playing in here when the Coliseum closed. So we know that can return. And of course, we know that wrestling, that Memphis is still a very important wrestling market. It's one of the best wrestling markets in the country. We've learned in doing this that uh, people wrestle at like, what is it, 13, 14 different locations around the city. Uh, I am not saying that wrestling could return to what it was in its heyday, uh, but I think it's still significant. And I think if you look at a, a right-sized, mid-sized, uh, mid-south uh, uh, coliseum that's made more in the kind of five to 7,000 uh, uh, seat count uh, uh, capacity, wrestling could be a very important uh, uh, anchor, anchor tenant as well. So we know the building's beloved, we know it's in good shape, and what we have seen is a continuous steady drumbeat of enthusiasm from the general public. And so that's one of the reasons we do these tours. But another reason is, and the reason the city uh, works in collaboration with us and allows us to do these, is that we know that from these tour groups is going to become the person with the ideas, the means, and the clout, or they're going to know somebody with those things, uh, sufficient to move the needle on a big idea. The TDZ does include some funding earmarked for the Coliseum, and yes, the TDZ did finally pass. So this project, the Fairgrounds, has lead funding, and which is now meaning that all the other funders in town, the philanthropic partners, you know, the foundations, the corporate community, and the developer community, are now all really going, okay, there's some money toward this thing. So, and, and, and the Coliseum is now in the TDZ application. It, it, there's language was added toward the tail end that says, the Coliseum will be preserved and not demolished. So that's codified into the application that then was received a unanimous uh, vote in approval. So we've got some funding toward the fair Let's ground. stop a second on TDZ yeah, yeah. funding, because I'm not sure any, everyone here would I understand. I did gloss over that really fast. So, yeah. so Tourism Development Zone is uh, an incentive created by the state that allows a city to pinpoint a specific major project that, that's tourism related that they can spend capital dollars improving, and they can borrow, they can, they can uh, borrow money towards that. And the way they pay off those bonds is that they look at the state or the, the sales tax in a three square mile area, and it's kind of gerrymandered in to include Overton Square and Cooper Young, and as much uh, potential commercial area that has uh, potential to have increases due to the actual tourism happening in those areas. So if you think about, you know, they've included Overton Square and Cooper Young, those areas are doing really well right now. They're not going to do, you know, they've got this much increment they can create. This building has zero sales tax dollars in it right now. So we're starting all the way down here. If we open this building, every single dollar that's raised from sales tax of uh, city, county, and state goes back into paying off the bonds for the TDZ, which includes all the youth sports uh, facilities and then potentially this building. We so think it could be a great economic engine for the fairgrounds. So the building's in excellent shape. It's beloved. There's a lot of enthusiasm and there are a lot of great ideas. Uh, ultimately, this lawsuit will be like settled. Uh, and I think, oh, one other thing. Recently, about a month ago, we did what was called the Coliseum Cleanup. And uh, John, you were there. Uh, and we had 50 plus volunteers come in here and clean up the building. So. Uh, y'all are in luck. We've given 60, 70 of these tours, but y'all are going to have a one where we've cleaned the place a little bit before you came here. And there's lights in the arena floor, there, which there never were before. That's right. So, w important to know about the cleanup. Not only is it cleaner, but the memorandum of understanding that we signed, that the Coliseum signed, Coliseum Coalition signed, uh, Clean Memphis, and the City of Memphis all signed, makes clear that the cleanup is intended to get this building ready for pre-vitalizing uses. Now, that doesn't mean ultimate reopening. That's much. That's probably farther down the road. Uh, but as early as this fall, there will be smaller scale events inside here. Uh, and just like we had Roundhouse Revival one May of 2015, and we've had two and three subsequently, we are in the early stages of planning Roundhouse Revival four, and hopefully we 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 expect to be able to be inside the building, and that will be significant. That will be the first. Uh, event inside the building, unless you count the cleanup itself. But uh. so you know, we're, we're talking a lot about mixed-use venues. We really believe, based on public input and talking to event promoters and, and everybody involved in those kind of um, facilities, that it is the highest and best use here. 
we believe that by bringing that same use back, but then adding the nostalgia things, the things that will bring tourists in, we can have the building open 365 days a year. So it, it, it could be sustainable for long term. There's a lot of square footage yeah. in the building, um, as you'll see in a second. So, so we are open to other ideas. When Wiseacre was interested in opening the building and having their, their uh, brewery here, we weren't opposed to it. We really felt it wasn't the best use of the building, and we thought that it was kind of putting a square peg in a round hole, literally. And it, it didn't work. It, it, it didn't pan out. So we didn't really work against it or for it, but you know, we're, we're definitely open to other ideas. But with all of the work we've been doing over the last four plus years, we know that it's sustainable. It's a market that we need. If you think of all of the musicians kind of up and coming that can't fill 19,000 seats at FedEx Forum, they, you know, if you can fill 6,000, you're not going to curtain off 13,000 seats yeah. there and spend that kind of money. Think about the musicians that are coming down that ladder, a lot of who play it, it, um, uh, live at the garden, at the Botanic Gardens, that have already played in this building, and they can't fill the FedEx Forum, but they can fill this building easily at the lower number. Yeah. So, so I kind of so we skipped over. Sure. The building was uh, held about 11,000 people. There was 9,100 people in fixed seats and between one and 2,000 on the floor, depending on how it was arranged. I have a plan to reduce the fixed seats to 4,900, and then on the floor would be similar. And in doing that, um, part of the reason for that is create more ADA seating. Uh, we're going to have an elevator that would go to the very top, and I'm going to take out three rows of seats that create a walkway that connect all of the light boxes, the press box, potential VIP boxes, making all of that accessible the way they've had to do over at the Liberty Bowl. Um, right now the aisles are all too narrow. You're going to take out a row of seats and we'll, we'll be able to show you all this once we get up there. But basically it will reduce the number of seats to 4,900 without making it look like there's less in there. It'll look completely full as it does today. Yeah, we think that the, the, the Coliseum could be, uh, the, we're, we do not have a mid-sized venue in our portfolio of venue offerings as a city. And uh, we feel that that is a contributing reason why Memphis has fallen to become a second or third tier concert destination city. Um, I think that's, that's, that's especially sad given our musical legacy here. Uh, our city would be more competitive at all the different concert sizes, even uh, the ones smaller than this and ones larger that could fit in this building. If we had this building back open as part of the kind of a concert and event ecosystem, if you will. Uh, but. At any rate, it, it, so if there are any, oh, and I, I want to recognize uh, Roy Barnes is the president of the Coliseum Coalition. Mark Jones is a, a board member with the Coliseum Coalition as well, and Chu's the VP. Uh, I'm a board member as well, co-founder. Uh, anything else that I've left out, Roy? Or no, I just want to ask, I mean, you may have asked this already, so I apologize. If, you, if Who has been in the Coliseum before? Okay, good. I always, I always like to, it's a good mix. I always like to see, see people, obviously, who have their experience. And also, I think it's, uh, you know, the, the story of Memphis and the story of everything we love about this city is in this building. So even if you never experienced it yourself. It's, the building really speaks to the authenticity of Memphis. I mean, this building just represents so much of it. And that's, that's the big reason why I'm a part of it. People would be shocked to know that I've never seen a music event here. And the only sporting event I ever saw here was hockey. Um, and I'm still, this, this building's beloved to me, and, it, and it's because of what it is. It's a citizen-owned, paid-for asset that's in incredible shape. So from a fiscal, sta conservative standpoint, why would you tear something down that I think you skipped over yeah. is eight to ten million dollars just to tear it down? Yeah, the, um, the Allen and Hoshel number, uh, that's the thank you, Chuch. That is one additional thing that they added, is that the Allen and Hoshel raised the amount to demolish from, from three million to between eight and ten million dollars. So you have a beloved building that's been proven to be in excellent shape, and it would cost between eight and ten million dollars to demolish. I think you start to realize why that language about it not being demolished is now codified in the, in the TDC application. What does so, it cost to open? Uh, between twenty-five and forty, essentially twenty-five on the conservative side. Chooch can get into more of the specifics. Uh, one one number is your more gold-plated number. One is a more minimalistic uh, uh, number, um, but. Uh, Lost my train of yeah, so, so you know, like that, that lower number doesn't include any loading docks back here. We could kind of excavate and have a truck pull down and have a dock at this level. Or you have, uh, you know, for years, for its whole life, they had uh, forklifts emptying it. So, you know, that kind of limits the type of show. But when we reduce the number of seats, you know, those bigger shows that, that have, you know, how many semis, they're, they're not 
it, you know, it could change. Yeah. So that budget um, <coughs> is making the ADA changes. The ADA changes are about $4 million okay. to do the ADA and life safety and stuff. We'll, he'll show we're going to show you how simple oh, okay. it is. So the city, yeah, yeah. the previous administration came up with this thick book of, of code violations and ADA violations. It was full of every single office and bathroom sign that should have been Braille, like a $2 item. I mean, they, they really stuffed this thing full of ridiculous things. Um, and we'll show you up there the concession stands don't have a lower transaction counter. All really simple stuff. The really complicated things uh, like access at the, the entries, I'm going to show you how we would do that very uh, efficiently. But if you remember one thing, uh, I think we can all conclude now that the Coliseum has been officially saved. Now what we do with it is what, is what remains. Uh, and like I said, there, there are these, uh, these impediments, this lawsuit, that these things have to work themselves through. Uh, but from our position, being four and a half years on doing this work, uh, which has been a labor of love, it's uh, it's it's just it, they're just problems to be solved, and I and, and I'm convinced that we that Memphis will find the civic will to do this, and when we get the general public in, I think that that you'll see an, another additional kind of like swelling of that civic uh, expectation, if you will. So ironically, we don't want to save the building for nostalgic reasons, but as I said, you know. To, to add to it so it's open 365 days a year, there are a lot of nostalgia, and we're going to see that on the tour. Legally, was the DOJ lawsuit uh, over ADA, so um, the Americans with Disabilities Act. You couldn't get in the building, you could, uh, and so the front door here, this is level. Liberty Land would have been right out these doors, this space is west. Sidewalks come right up to here. The north and south entrances, they're down about, uh, the outside's about three feet lower. Very easy to ramp up. But all three entrances, you end up up here. So we're six feet below the upper concourse and six feet above the, the lower one. The way they handled it during the day was they installed this lift. You would have been able to get on a lift here, a uh, little platform, and you would have gone down or gone up. The problem with that is it broke down all the time. Um, a woman by the name of Deborah Cunningham, uh, she's since passed, but she was the head of the Memphis Center for Independent Living, uh, who uh, fight for you know, their advocates for disability rights. They're the ones that actually got the DOJ to sue the city on a lot of this stuff. But one day, one night she came in for an event and she was actually arrested because she threw a fit because they had not maintained this and it didn't work. And so um, the city used that excuse to, to close the building down. Uh, what we've discovered in our assessment is that those problems are not that big a deal. Um, we looked at it from a different perspective in that we don't want mechanical things that will break down. Obviously, you have to have an elevator to get to the very top over there, but for the general public coming in and out, we need to do it in a different way, and that would be with ramping. So each of these major entrances has ticket booths on either side. This main entrance actually has smaller ones, and when we go by one of the other entrances, you'll see they're, they're bigger. Those aren't needed today with today's technology. You actually don't want people queuing up in front of the exit doors here. So, you get rid of that and you ramp up, and it actually would come, go out and come back and end up right at the top of these stairs over here, which when you're designing for people with disabilities, you want them to come in the same door that you come in, and you want them to end up in the same place too. So it's absolutely ideal. For the other side, you can go down, or you could actually go down the outside of the building and come in. So the really low cost things that don't have to be maintained over time to, to, to cost money. Concession counter, you gotta have a lower area for someone in a wheelchair. The beauty of how this building's built, look at these blocks under here. I can take out these six blocks right here, cut that down, drop it down for a couple hundred bucks, you're done. It's ridiculous that those excuses were used to close the building down. It's really, I mean, it might be nicer signage, but you know, <laughs> you want to go with the vintage look? Here. I want to There's nothing here. Yeah. It's in great shape. I mean, literally have to wash the floors. Um, what was the incentive for them to inflate the reasons to close the building? Is there because some people there? were going to make a lot of money building a new facility. Okay, that's what okay. I think yeah. some, some, something like that. Um, the whole plan all along was to tear this down. So what he's talking about, friends, is they can turn those steps or, or into a ramp. You can see there's plenty of room. So it's going to be very easy so to be compliant. So usually we pop up in here and our eyes are just now adjusted, but... When we did the cleanup, the city actually added these two lights, and it's, it's been fantastic. We've never actually gotten to see it kind of in this light. It's pretty amazing. Um, as you can see, there's all this stuff on the floor. The city stores stuff in here. We're trying to get them to move this stuff out so that we can do events. Those, those white crates over there are the Memphis sign that came off the concrete silos down by Bass Pro when they tore down that facility. Um, these 
wood boxes over here are the lockers from Liberty Bowl. They just did a renovation to their locker rooms a couple months ago. Um, it's just a lot of junk that uh, the city and the Liberty Bowl folks are storing in here. So The carousel was in here for a while. Yeah, before the carousel got restored, it was in two shipping containers here. Yeah, which you, you, that should have told you enough because if they're going to store the, the, the carousel in here, you should have known that it's, that it's protected from weather, right? Um, even before the assessments were made. By the way, I should say, I know a lot of y'all are take, taking pictures, taking video. Uh, I hope this would go without saying, but just in case anybody wondered, it's totally okay to share in social media. We haven't figured out a, a, a unified hashtag, but anything you'd want to create, Coliseum forever, Coliseum of the future, whatever. It's, it's totally up to you, and there are some really neat photos to take, and you're absolutely encouraged to share these in social media, because as you do, people will start to realize, hey, gosh, this, this Coliseum coming back online is, is, a, is a real thing, you know? Uh, and we, we absolutely think it's going to happen. Uh, it's really just a matter of time. Uh, so absolutely, about, uh, share in social media if you want. Um, around this time, we, we, we talk about our friends at the Levitt Shell. So, and this relates to uh, the whole idea, how much is it going to cost? Is it going to be 25 or 40 or 45 million? And it really depends on how deluxe you want to go, right? If you want to do uh, reopen the place kind of bare bones, which is really the approach that the Levitt Shell took. When they redid the shell, they opened it up, and I thought it looked great, you know, like, but what they did is they opened it up minimally so that they could get people falling in love with it again and being like, oh, how great is it that we've got the shell back and we're seeing sh live music here. Uh, and then they raised, the, with that enthusiasm, they had the, the civic will to do a capital campaign and raise the funds to gold plate it. We think a similar staged approach here at the Mid-South Coliseum uh, could also be effective. So imagine sitting just like I am now. This, looks, this is exactly what it looks like when you take the seats out. You can have your little bench cushion or your, your blanket, whatever, and we could be in here with zero seats. Um, and, and so if you think, though, if we do want to do the seats like I had discussed, these aisles are too narrow for today's standards. Um, you need a, a, they need to be wider and a railing down the middle. Look what happens when you take out one row of seats here all you have to do is extend this step over a little bit. Not a major improvement that has to be made. Uh, if you notice, the seats are pretty narrow compared to today's standards if you went into a new arena. Make them a couple inches wider. Also put a cup holder between each of them. These will start spreading out a little bit. Uh, imagine behind here where the elevator goes up, you're going to have a V shape up here with your line of sight that the seats behind that would be removed. Uh, at different levels up here, we would take the three rows outside of the top and uh, have a walkway connecting these light booths to the elevator and the press box here to the elevator, to potential VIP booths up yeah. there, um, and then some, uh, again, the restaurant coming out over an area right here below us or the other side, and you start chopping down that, that 9,100 number down to 4,900, which really fits in where concert promoters are telling us we really need to be the sweet spot to be able to afford to manage a facility is, is really in that... What, what Graceland has proved to us, and they've done way more research than us, is that a 62, 6,500 square seat arena is that sweet spot that you can make money on. Yeah, so. and that was, that was actually it was very helpful to us because we've been saying that Memphis needed something like, and that was somebody but outside of us who said, we need this and we want to build this. So it kind of helped prove our point for us. The other thing uh, that um, uh, in, in bringing 9,100 down to 4,900, uh, with all these different ways, it's not like we're taking out one big swath of seats so that it's like an obvious, uh, you know, gaping hole. It, it's done here and there such that the arena would still look full. Yeah, we've had people go, oh, we'll just remove the seats at the top. Well, that just leaves you this down here. How do you maintain a building if that's all the people you can get in? So, yeah, it's very doable.
These are the same tiles that I showed you down below at the concession stand, but they're perforated. Uh, they're, they're a clay tile, but on the inside is, is insulation. So some of the sound gets absorbed and some of it bounces off. So acoustically, this building, a lot of times we've been in here, someone will be all the way on the other side talking, and if we're quiet here, we can hear their conversation. It's really eerie. Like, you could, like, have a conversation with a person at the corresponding side over there. You'd have to elevate your voice a little bit, but not much, and you could totally hear it back and forth. Really so high. last September, Alex Green came in and uh, played a little acoustic set for us. He was actually the first musician to be able to do something. And Chooch was sitting right at this top row, and Alex was down on the, at the venue floor. And this is this is how good his phone picked up. It's just with my iPhone top row, and he's dead dead center in the arena. So when, when we want to do uh, pre-vitalization, I want to do some acoustic sets in here. So anybody who is not afraid of heights, or if you're afraid of heights and want the one opportunity to overcome that fear, which a lot of people have here, we're going up on the catwalk above. And we'll be above the scoreboard, and you'll get a great shot of the scoreboard from through the tile. Ready to roll us? All right. Yeah. And it's it's there's a little bit of swaying in the. I am terrified of heights, but I'm going. Oh, you should. Yeah, I'm gonna go, but I am terrified of heights. There's Tammy. One hit. So. So a lot of y'all probably heard rumors of ceiling tiles falling during monster truck shows. Yes. We do have a board member that actually saw that happen once, but that's not the reason why the majority of these tiles are gone. If we were downstairs and you look up and remember to do that when we get down there, most of the tiles are gone over where the stage is. And that's because there was no rigging under the ceiling to rig all the lights. It was above. So these burlap sacks that you see kind of through here, they would have wrapped them around this angle iron and clamped the light on them. If you look here, these panels are hinged. So a lot of the missing uh, panels down there are just flipped up and they're hinged for lighting. Uh, Some cool. of them have fallen over the years. Um, one of the really cool about things about this ceiling, if we get historic tax credits, we'll probably have to put it back pretty similar to what it is. But even with this radial shape, look at how many of the tiles are two foot by four foot standard tiles. It's every fourth bay has this kind of angle. So it's actually the cost of replacing the ceiling is not crazy either because it's a standard acoustic tile ceiling. 200 of these lights in here that hold 1,000 watt bulbs. So imagine the heat put off of that 200,000 watts. Um, and so if we replace those with LED, imagine the, the savings that is. But you can see some of these bulbs, how big they are. Um, pretty amazing. What did you say about the burlap sacks? Why are they so, up well, they're up, they're probably someone threw those there, but they're here to, so when a, a, a light clamps on it, it can clamp tighter because if it was just on the metal, it would rub and can come loose. Ah, uh, okay. So it gives it that little bit of friction. Interesting. Well, I think what you're talking about, is this over the stage? We're over the, sta the stage. Okay. So this is the, the winch that lowers the um, the speaker. So I'm actually over the stage right so, now. So see, in concerts, they do concert rigging where they tie to the building mm -hmm. and they lift the – Elvis had concert rigging that lifted up over his head. Mm-hmm. So they would tie to these beams and pull it straight up over his head. Yep. And that's oh. that's how they do it. These so, uh, play these type venues were not set up for that mm -hmm. because that was new, you yeah. know, relatively new. They say that Disney is the one, that company is the one that found all the rig points and all the yeah. policies. So we we um we've talked to some experts that do a lot of this now, and they and, and it would be best to have a second system below the ceiling now. Right. And I believe, from a historic standpoint, we can do that. I don't think we can get rid of the ceiling. Uh, the acoustics are so great anyway, right. I don't think we would want to. But I think the, the government would allow us to hang another system below and have that figured out. So um, on the tour with Jerry Lawler, uh, I, I said, you know, oh, I'm going to bring you somewhere I bet you've never been. And so I bring him up here. He's like, no, I've been on the catwalk. Like, Damn it. Why were you up there? He said, uh, you know, they used to compete to see who could come into the arena in a more fabulous way. And he had about a 160-pound stagehand come up to him one day and said, I got a harness and a rope, and we're going to lower you down into, the, into the, the ring. So he comes up here, and they were about three levels up from here. And Jerry's like, well, where's the, uh, where's the winch? And the guy goes, oh, there's no winch. I'm going to tie the one end of the rope to me, wrap it around this. <laughs> And lower you down. And they did that. Wow. He said he'd never do it again, but he's glad he did it. But he never wanted to ever do it again. Wow. Um, his other 
kind of crazy story about coming into the arena. It's kind of horrifying and, and just crazy all around. But um, they were coming into the arena, and the fabulous ones were in a white Cadillac convertible coming in, and then Bill Dundee's on a white um, Harley coming in after them, and there's all this smoke and, and lights and everything and all this fanfare. And then Jerry pulls up the rear on his white stallion and his crown, and as he's going up, this police officer is holding this teenage girl in his arms, walking by the left. Then another cop comes by the right, carrying this girl, and he gets up there. And he's like, "Bill, these we're so hot. These girls are just passing out left and right." And Bill goes, "No, man, they shined the light in my face, and I took out part of the crowd with my motorcycle." So everybody was okay in the end, but um, that was his other kind of crazy entrance story. Wow. Love it. You can go. Using it as a temporary use, it's just a lot of waivers and things like that. Sure. We're we're definitely willing to help make something make something happen with that because the more the more exposure we can get, it's going to the right. It's only going to help. Um, and I, what we'll just need to do is whatever you're doing, we need to alleviate their fears that the Department of Justice will have any issue. Although you know they were talking to Bluff City Law about turning this into a soundstage for them. Hmm. But I think the hurdles just too many. Just too many. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, yeah. All right, now just take your time, Lee. You will cuss a lot. <laughs> so he didn't think about that. So he even says, trust me. Trust me. He knew from experience, right? <laughs> What's why? I don't know. I'm not sure why they didn't just put some foam here. Or, like, or turn that thing over. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, think. Thankfully, they didn't because we got this yeah. funny sign. Yeah, or cut the, uh, the ends off, at least. But yeah, 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 yeah. That American flag is probably come on, come on original. Down, guys. Can... Yeah, that's big time. So, friends, this right here is what it would look like from the very top. This is the very top row. And they're going to be taking this top row out, so these seats are going to be gone. But the stage would be right there. Not only thanks for coming and making the time today, but also we give these these oh sorry excuse me we we give these VIP tours because uh, you all or people you know uh, have the money and clout sufficient to move the needle on a big idea, and we know that third party uh, uh, funding is going to be part of how this place reopens permanently, and we talked about pre-vitalizing uses. Those are we're going to be accomplish those type of uses here in the next few months this fall. But uh, in terms of permanent uh, reopening, uh, it is going to take third party investment. Everyone knows that. And, and in fact, that's why the city works with us. We, we, we all agree that third party investment is going to be needed to make all this happen. So we feel like we're at a special time. We feel like we've turned a couple of really important uh, corners. Uh, getting the TDZ, the city getting the TDZ uh, passed was big. Uh, we think w working through the, the, the blocks and, and, and coming up with a memorandum of understanding that allowed us to get in here and clean up the building with volunteers was another major step. Uh, the city has made clear to us that now that memorandum of understanding can serve as a uh, template MOU for events that will happen uh, as early as, like I said, this fall. Um, so that's, that's new, that's, you know, we, four and a half years in, we, we feel like we've hit some really important milestones just in the last six months that's making everyone realize that something is going to happen here at the Mid-South Coliseum. The, 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 uh, the composition of these VIP tours has changed a lot in the last six months because there's language in the TDZ that says the Coliseum will, will be preserved and not demolished. It's part of the city's RFP process, so the city has made clear that they are open to a good idea coming forward for the Coliseum. And that means that a lot of people who'd waved us off before, like, it's great, I love you, love you guys, it's great, but like, never gonna happen, what was, what was they, some of them actually said that, uh, but it was certainly part of their thinking. They didn't wanna waste their time. Those same people who once waved off the tour are now going on the tour in great numbers. And what that tells us is, the people who are smart who realize it's time to make a play on this building financially come up with those uses. Now is the time to really task their brain with figuring out what that is. That's all a huge encouragement. So if there are other people you know that uh, you go, and I, and I bet y'all are going to think of who these people are. You're like, Ted needs to take, Sally needs to take this to her, what happened? And at this point, and we're really close to public events in the building, uh, and which is exciting. 
But uh, for right now, the composition of these VIP tours need to be someone of, 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 of influence. And, and if you're on this tour today, that means you're an influencer. Uh, and we appreciate you making the time. So if there are other people who you know who are heads of organizations, board members for, you know, uh, an organization that might have sway over what happens here, uh, or they're uh, an, an architect, or they have some, you know, technical expertise that would, that would inform this process, um, let us know. One last thing, uh, later today I will send out an email with a link to our executive summary the ex of all the research we've done. Uh, there is a uh, there are links within that document to all the research we've done, the assessment that that, that Chuch and his team did, a business plan, uh, an analysis of indoor seating decline versus population growth, uh, uh, three different documents related to understanding the uh, the, uh, the the non compete the Grizzlies non compete clause. Honestly, there's more information than most of you will want to dig into, but it's all there if you want to look at it. So uh, look at that. If you have a question, let us know. And then at that point, you'll be connected to us via email. Uh, and if you, if you have other people that you want to e-introduce us to, like, hey, meet my, my friend. He ought to go on the tour. We'd love those introductions. Thank you so much for taking the time. Really appreciate awesome. it. Is there a website? Uh, Coliseumcoalition.org. Got to have that. Yep. Yeah.